I'm going to hand these out also. These have to do with our speaker tonight, Mr. Peter Friedman. He is going to speak to us on a little bit of uh, information, a little bit of information on um, uh, Fast and Furious, if you want to hear about it. He has some in-depth information on Benghazi, and then he's going to talk to us about how to not be a victim. This handout has to do with how to not being a victim, so I'm going to be passing that out to you. I'd like to preface uh, my introduction to him with the fact that I spoke to Peter about a little over a week ago, and uh, in the course of our conversation on the phone, he made a couple of statements to me about Benghazi that I thought were hmm, a little bit of, a little bit black helicopter, and I thought, well, you know, I, uh, I still owe it to, to my people to make sure that they can hear every angle and, um, and make their own decisions. And as it turned out, about two days to three days later, because Peter was a special ops guy, so he did have some connections, two to three days later, everything hit the news that Peter had already told me. So he's got some solid information. So I don't think I have anything else. Do I? No. Okay, so I'm going to turn the microphone or the evening over to Peter Friedman, and he can do these three things in any order he wants. Right here. See. Okay, this one's going to work. You might want to move that back. We're here. Testing. Testing. Oh, good. I think the last time I was here talking about Islam, I mentioned the fact that this reminds me of what I got from my bar mitzvah to shave with. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, Doris, you know, was asking about uh, Fast and Furious in Benghazi. I've been in the uh, firearms business now for about 40 years, and uh, used to have a federal firearms dealer's license. I'm very familiar with the ATF and what they do. Um, and what they don't do, and Fast and Furious, I think you know from just watching the news, was totally botched, and it was supposed to be a tracer operation, uh, which they now talk about gun walking, and that has to do with Benghazi, yes. but uh, they were trying to gun walk mm -hmm. some uh, weapons down there to the drug cartel so that they could wind up tracing them. Uh, but the whole thing was insane, and if you connect all the dots, basically Fast and Furious uh, was put into effect to subvert the Second Amendment. And if you recall, about four years ago, as soon as uh, Hillary became Secretary of State, she was down there talking to the President of Mexico, uh, who is an interesting guy in his own right, and uh, about how uh, they were going to concoct this thing where he was going to complain that the guns being used to murder all the Mexicans down there on the border were being furnished by the United States and can you please do something with an arms treaty to stop the flow of arms down there and that's basically what it was. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Now, Benghazi was another gun walking situation. Okay, nobody in the media yet has asked the question, what was Stevens doing in Benghazi? Nobody's asked that yet. Okay, nobody of any consequence that has a decision-making responsibility. Okay, like our phony pseudo-news media and whatever. Nobody has asked what Stevens was doing in Benghazi having come from Tripoli, where he was protected, driving in an unarmed uh, SUV with no protection to the consulate in Benghazi, knowing that it was unprotected and that he really had no protection there. But what they have released was the fact that on 9-10, he did meet at 8 p.m. with the Turkish consul. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've got to put the dots together here. If you connect the dots, you discover that one of the problems with Libya is that Obama was arming Al-Qaeda. Now, go back 40 years to when we created Osama bin Laden. We created Osama bin Laden, Jimmy Carter, and his national security advisor, Brzezinski, who's still floating around. I'd like to have their medical plan. 
I really would. I don't know how these guys managed to stay alive. I want their medical plan. It's like Ted Kennedy. The guy had a malignant brain tumor and they kept him alive for a year and a half. I want that medical plan. Okay? I don't think it's Obamacare. No, it's not. Anyway, so if you go back 40 years and think about Carter and the Russians, Brzezinski was a Pole. Brzezinski hated the Russians because the Russians killed his father. So he was going to do everything he possibly could when the Russians originally invaded Afghanistan in order to get rid of them. Anybody here see Charlie Wilson's War? Absolutely. You remember the movie? Yes, I do. Okay. Well, you got to read between the lines in that. And by the way, if you remember the film, uh, yeah, Zia ul Haq did kill Budo. So, okay, that's part of a whole Taliban lecture. Anyway. So what happened in Benghazi was the same thing. What we did was we created the rebels in Libya. Okay? Now, you also got to understand who Cass Sunstein is. You know who Cass Sunstein is? Okay. He used to be, he used to be the regulatory czar. Right. That's right. Okay? And now he left and now he's back teaching at law school again. If you go on my website obamathreat.com and go under thesis more like feces, you can read his <laughs> Yale Law School uh, thesis that he wrote that Obama used to issue all of his executive orders and go around Congress. That's where that came from. Uh, Sunstein's wife is a woman named Samantha Power. Samantha Power is certifiably nuts. Okay? Besides that, she is a vehement anti Semite. She hates Jews. She hates Israel. And what she did together with Susan Rice, of course, you know who she is. What she did was she created a doctrine under Obama for the United Nations called R2P, or the Responsibility to Protect. And this was a doctrine where. Places like Syria or Libya or Egypt. Notice that these are in the Middle East, where these dictatorial governments were persecuting their own civilian populations, that under the United Nations and under the responsibility to protect doctrine, that the UN, in theory, could go in with arms and and, and uh, soldiers in order to protect the civilian population. Well, now connect a few more dots. Samantha Power was one of the main people behind the flotilla of arms that was going into Gaza. You beginning to connect something here? Okay, so what is going to happen ultimately, especially if Obama gets reelected, is that American troops are going to begin to bomb Israel. Because we have to protect the poor Palestinians from the big, nasty Israelis. And that's what Libya was. It was a dry run for the responsibility to protect doctrine. Okay, that's why he went to NATO, he went to the UN, he did not go to our Congress because our Congress would not have authorized it under the War Powers Act. So he went directly to the United Nations, he got permission from the UN, and they had to get rid of Gaddafi because they wanted to see if this doctrine was going to work. So what happened was we started selling and sending arms to Al-Qaeda, and we knew it was Al-Qaeda in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi. Now, one of the problems that we have here now is Syria. And everybody wants to know if we were helping the civilians in, in Libya, how come we're letting Bashar Assad kill 30,000 Syrians in Syria? Why aren't we doing something in Syria? Yeah. Okay, well, because what we're doing is we're doing it clandestinely along with the Turks. And the last thing you ever want to do is get in bed with the Turks. But what has happened now, and the reason that Stevens went to Benghazi is because Stevens was CIA, and he was the guy prior to four months ago when Hillary elevated him to ambassador for running all of the guns through Libya meeting with the Libyans and the Al-Qaeda in Libya, and they were then sticking them on boats and taking them to Syria. So now you have the two former Navy SEALs, absolutely innocent in this whole thing. And they're actually the heroes in this thing. 
Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Because they did what we've trained them to do and what they knew was the correct thing to do. So what you had here was you had Glenn Doherty, who was already in the annex, and that was the CIA facility in Benghazi. You had Tyrone Woods, who happened to be in Tripoli at the time this whole thing went down. Now the news media told you that these guys were both together. Not true. Initially, Woods came from Tripoli. And he came with a contingent of people who hopped in a car and drove like hell to get to Benghazi to help the people in Benghazi. Okay, when this thing first went down. Okay, so what you have now is you have Stevens meeting with the Turkish consul on the evening of 9-10. He arrived there in the morning of 9-10. So now he meets with the Turkish consul in Benghazi and they were concocting this weapons smuggling deal all right, that was going to go in a Turkish ship from Benghazi up to uh, Syria to arm the people, Al-Qaeda people and stuff in Syria to try and overthrow Bashar Assad. Because if you know, and you've been watching the news, Syria and, and Turkey have been throwing rocks at each other lately. Okay? All right, and Syria's not a, or Turkey's not a nice guy anyway. Anyway, there to one. Okay, so what happened was, the deal went bad. The deal went bad. And there's another side, side show to this thing in Benghazi. Well, what happened was the SEALs were there as subcontractors. They were no longer in the military, and they were in Benghazi as contractors to try and find out two things. A, what happened to all of the weaponry that Gaddafi had that was missing, and what happened to the 20,000 shoulder-fired Stinger missiles that we gave to Al-Qaeda in Libya? That's why they were there. Okay? They had no idea what Stevens was doing there. So when the firing started down there at the consulate, the word went out everywhere, because every, all those emails went out in real time, within minutes, that they were under attack. Glenn Doherty, one of the former SEALs, was there trying to get everybody out of the consulate. What's it? A Tyrone Woods showed up with the contingent from Tripoli. He connected up with, with uh, Glenn Doherty. And the two of them then went over to the consulate, after they were told twice, by the way, through CIA channels to stand down and leave things alone. Don't help. And there's a reason for that. Don't help. And they finally, the third time, said to hell with this. We're going to go over there. There are Americans under attack over there, and we're going to go see if we can help. In fact, they saved probably close to 30 people. They got them out of the consulate. They got them down the street. They got them over to the annex building where the CIA people were. They got cars and stuff. They got them out of there about an hour before the, the annex was attacked. But the bottom line here is very interesting if you connect the dots. Stevens was set up. Okay? Stevens was set up. The consensus of opinion in the knowledgeable intelligence arena is that and this is so much like Reagan and Carter that it's just it's spooky. It's like they, they read a playbook from thirty some odd years ago. Well what happened was a lot of people in the know believe that Obama set Stevens up to be kidnapped. So that the last couple of days before the election, unlike Porter, he would be the hero, he would negotiate for our ambassador's release, however, at the cost of releasing, pardon me, the blind shake. And that was the deal that's just kind of simmering. <coughs> Excuse me. So just keep keep your eyes open because on, on the morning of 9-12, I sent out a whole email. I know Doris got it. A couple of other people got it saying, you know something? This was a gun-walking deal. This was a gun-walking deal. And the two Navy SEALs happened to stumble into this because they were heroes. Because they were SEALs. And they were Americans, and Americans were under fire. Now... 
As of this morning, it appears that General Ham, Carter Ham, has been placed under house arrest. And the admiral who was in charge of the battle group, who will put the battle group on alert and who was going to launch F-16s and, and uh, F-18 Hornets, no, that's a different guy. Ham was going to do that from Italy. But the admiral uh, who was in charge of that group now has also been relieved of command. And if Obama gets reelected, it's all going to get swept under the carpet. Oh, know that. Uh, so that's a great segue into refuse to be a victim. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can you carry that story a little bit further on the AC 130s? Okay. That they thought we're going to be there. And all right. Well, here, here's. Okay. Okay, I can tell you this. And before you segue, I'd like to put in a couple words in between all that. Okay. okay. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, all right. You were told that the two SEALs were on top of the building at the annex and they were hit with a mortar. Okay? You were also told that they had a laser rangefinder. Right. Okay, it's called a GLD. Okay? It's a ground laser designator. Right. Now, the ground... How many people saw Top Gun? Yeah. Everybody saw Top Gun. Okay, do you remember when they're they're doing the dog fighting up there and the guy goes to missiles and he's trying to get on the target and he receives a tone? Okay? The laser, the ground, the GLD, the ground laser designator that will light up a target with the laser will not actually light that target with the laser unless it's in sync with the drone. Oh. This is why the questions came up last week with some of the uh, the Democrat senators and the uh, I think it was Chris Wallace who said, "Well, can you confirm that the drone that was over the consulate circling was armed?" And they refused to answer the question. The point is that Doherty's up there. He's got the GLD. He's lighting up the mortar crew. He knows that the drone is circling. He assumed when he got the tone that the that the laser designator was in fact now synced with the armed drone that it would fire. That's disgraceful. That's disgraceful. I, I know I'm a Navy vet, and I, I just I can't get my arms around the fact that these guys sat in the Situation Room at the White House and watched our guys get slaughtered and did nothing and wound up relieving the command of the admiral and the general who in fact tried to do something and told the Navy SEALs to stand down. Now why would they have told them to stand down? Because they were going to screw up the kidnapping. And it was not supposed to happen that way. That's pretty scary that we have a president and we have a rat who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dempsey, who still thinks that was his idea to call Fort Hood workplace violence. That was his idea. And he's... surprised his hair isn't really brown uh, where he has it, but... So where does Hillary fit into all this? Where does Hillary fit into this? Uh, <laughs> Better myself. There's your answer. The Lord provided. Oh, this one's dead. All right, yeah. Hillary was going to be a dupe. Yeah. Uh, but Hillary's a little smarter than that. So anyway, is this on? Dead, dead. Dead. One, two, three, four. Okay, so I'll yell. We're all this dead. is dead. We're all dead. Okay. At some point. Okay, you want what? No? They're all useful idiots, as Joseph Solon said. Yeah. Hillary fell on the fell on the sword for Obama. No, she was in Peru. Peru. She was out of the country. Oh. They got her out of the country. Have you seen Susan Rice by the way? Where is Susan Rice? Who told Susan Rice to go and lie on the 16th of September on five different news programs? Right. Valerie Jarrett. Okay. And Valerie Jarrett's an interesting piece of work because 
You probably, well, I don't know if you know her not. You know, she was born in Iran. Yes, he was. Not only was she born in Iran, but her father-in-law, Vernon Jarrett, was the head of the Communist Party in Chicago. Oh, that's absolutely right. Okay? All of this is on my website, obamathreat.com. Now can I segue, Doris? Yes. Okay, so now we're going to segue into refuse to be a victim. Okay, so what, what we're going to do here for the next hour is go through some of the highlights of the NRA's Refuse to Be a Victim program. Yes. Your website. What's your website? Which one? The Obama one. I have ObamaThreat.com and IslamThreat.com. Okay, the NRA has got this program called Refuse to Be a Victim, and it's a dynamite program. I've been teaching this thing for a while. It's basically a four-hour program. And it costs like 25 bucks. And the reason that it, there is a cost to it because everybody who attends it gets this whole packet of material. You got a whole workbook here to work from, some brochures and stuff like that. What I am going to do is give you a basic overview of the program. Hopefully at some point Doris can convince everybody that we got to spend three to four hours together at some point and go through the whole program which is really terrific, okay? Except when I do it down at Rossmore and half the people are asleep after the first five minutes. Well, that's not us. What? Can we, can we, can we, can we, we can do whatever you want. Sure. Excellent. Okay, I guess we're going to take a potty break in 30 minutes. Body break? Yeah, potty. 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 These basically are my credentials. I'm an NRA instructor for pistol, rifle, shotgun, uh, refuse to be a victim. If anybody ever wants to be a range safety officer, I'm also an NRA chief range safety officer. So you attend the eight-hour class, and we go through playing with all kinds of guns, shotguns, rifles, pistols, taking them apart, uh, fixing malfunctions and stuff like that. Where are you located? Concord. How much do they make? I'll come officers? here, though. Ah. I travel. I have, I have a lot of guns. I have gun will travel. Them anywhere. Is it, I mean, a range to practice. Uh, I have a range down there. Exactly. And I also have a deal up here with uh, Center Mass. In Fairfield? Uh, in Fairfield. Yeah. Matter of fact, I train Tubbs, Tubbs and his wife oh, to be range safety officers. Well. We love Tubbs. How much okay. they make as officers, so these range officers? Pardon me? How much they make as range they officers? They don't. Unless you're employed by a range. Okay, I have business cards up here. Just grab a business card. Okay, besides what is up here, how many people are familiar with CERT? Community, community Emergency Response Team. I'm also a CERT instructor, which has been interesting too. Um, I was a flying narc for the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department for five years, from 79 oh, wow. to 84. Uh, I flew the airplane that was involved in the only shoot down of a drug running airplane over the domestic United States in July of 79. First time and last time it's ever been done. All the police department academies now teach what I did as to what never to do, which I find interesting. <laughs> so, anyway, I have some, some knowledge about this subject. Okay, refuse to be a victim is a is a nationally recognized crime prevention program. There's a lot of police departments and sheriff's offices that will put it on. Designed to provide men and women with information that assists in the development of their own personal safety strategies. When I teach, I teach the three fundamentals of personal protection. The first is mindset. If you don't have the right mindset, you will be a victim. I'll explain what that means. The second thing is tactics. Not only do you have to think that you can do something to protect yourself, you have to figure out how you're going to do it. And the third and the least important is marksmanship, 
in case you happen to have a firearm that you intend to use for your own personal protection. That's the least of it. You've got to have the mindset. I do a lot of women on target programs and I find it interesting because I get a lot of ladies in there periodically and I said, okay, mindset, number one. If you have to protect your life or someone else's life from a bad guy or a bad lady, can you shoot them? Absolutely. There it is. I love her. Okay? And if you can't, and I've had people saying, oh no, I can't do that. I Morally, I could not shoot another person. And I would say, here's your money back. Okay? Go buy yourself a can of wasp spray at Home Depot. It works great. It's far better than pepper spray because pepper spray, you got to be this close to this person and they got to be looking at you. Wasp spray. <laughs> Try and say that five times. <laughs> we'll shoot 20 feet. Yep, it will. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to buy some time. So essentially you have to have a mindset to protect yourself. Now, how you're going to do that, that's a little different story. Okay? If you're going to use a firearm, then you have to understand what goes along with it. Okay? Tactics. Right? You have to develop some tactics. It's like being a Boy Scout. What am I going to do if... I'm also a flight instructor, and every time I take somebody up in the airplane, I chop the power, and I go, okay, you're not paying attention. You just lost the engine. Where are you going to put this thing down safely? And by the time they spend a couple hours with me, believe me, they are flying from freeway to freeway to freeway. <laughs> Because there's two kinds of pilots. Those that have had it happen to them and those that are going to have it happen to them. <laughs> and I have had it happen to me twice. And I knew precisely what to do. It was the best instrument landing at Santa Monica Airport anybody had ever seen. No. Turned it into a glider over Century City in the fog. Okay. So the third thing is marksmanship. Now, if you guys go in to purchase a firearm... Don't buy it because A, it's pink and it's cute. Or B, oh, that's nice and light. I like that. You don't want to do that because the weight of the firearm absorbs the recoil. Okay? And when you go in there, first test a bunch of firearms out, which is what I do if, for people who think they want to buy one. And I've got probably 10, 12 different guns, revolvers, semi-autos, 22, all the way through to a 45. And we go up to the range, and you shoot them. And you see what it is you can handle. Because the key in marksmanship is shot placement. If you are using a 1911 45 or an old Army Colt 45, and you can't hit anything with it, you might as well throw it at them. <laughs> But if you, like me, can put a 22, okay, through the bullseye at 45 feet, 15 yards, I have no problem defending myself with a 22. 22s kill. On the evening of March 20th, 1967, I was an L.A. County Sheriff's Deputy. My partner was killed standing next to me, closer than you and I are right now, by a guy, another deputy, believe it or not, who put two 22 slugs in his chest and Mike was dead in 10 minutes. Happened to be Milton Burl's nephew, by the way. Mm. So a 22 properly placed will do more damage than a 45 not properly placed. So number three marksmanship is shot placement, correct? Okay? What's interesting is that the Mafia and the CIA use 22s. And that's got to tell you something. Of course, they do walk right up behind you and cap you. <laughs> Not much target okay. to worry about. This program has been around since 1993. It was originally designed for women. And finally, the guys got tired of dropping the girls off at the, you know, the seminar, and then they went out and, you know, probably sat in the bar or watched football or <laughs> both and everything. The and they said, "No, hey, look, you know, we'd like to hear this too." So in 1997, the NRA made this a co-ed program. Now I don't know about your town, but this is from Pleasant Hill, where I leave last week. 
We have a tremendous crime wave going on. The media doesn't want to tell you this. The police don't want to tell you this because they're understaffed. In Pleasant Hill, we have a population of 35,000, and at any one shift, we only have eight uniformed officers on duty. We have some serious problems. So if you take a look at this, which comes right out of the Pleasant Hill PD, and you will find that residential burglary is up 25% over last year, commercial 100% auto burglary, 160% theft from auto, 47% auto theft, 133%. You've got aggravated assault that's up, domestic violence that's up. All of this stuff is up. You got to go to your local police department and tell them you want to get the crime stats, and you will discover what's going on. We've had five armed robberies just around Sun Valley Mall. This is in the last month. Now, when you guys, Christmas is coming up, and you guys are going to go to the mall, and you're going to have a tough time trying to find a parking place, and you're going to be walking out to the back forty with a load of gifts. And there are guys who are cruising the parking lots after dark. Okay, it gets dark early. They cruise the parking lot after dark. They usually work in teams of two. One guy drives the car. The other guy leaps out of the car with a gun, holds you up, grabs all of your packages that you just came out of the mall with, throws them in the car, and they take off. It's happening. It happened last year. We had a whole lot of situations at the Sun Valley Mall that way. You got malls all the way up and down Highway 80 here. So you have to start being a little more observant of your surroundings. And we'll get into that in a few minutes. Now, what's wrong with this picture? I pulled up behind this woman at a stoplight down there by Concord Airport. And I got out of the car and I walked over and I talked to her and she pulled over and I was with her for about 20 minutes trying to explain why you don't drive a Mercedes with the door unlocked, the driver's side window down, and $10,000 with a Rolex watch and a diamond ring hanging out the window. Because there are people who are crossing the street who have bolt cutters. Okay? They grab your arm, they pull it out, the other guy takes the bolt cutter, cuts your finger off, he's not going to sit there trying to pull the ring off. He just takes the whole finger out, and they're gone. When you go out shopping, keep your eye open for how close where you're shopping is to a freeway on-ramp. Okay? Don't ever buy a house that doesn't butt up to a neighbor's house across the back fence. Don't ever buy a home that butts up to a canal where there's nobody on the other side. Because it's an escape route. If you don't know who people are that are coming there to do your landscaping, cut your grass, maybe a hot day, you want to give them lemonade, make them the lemonade and bring it out to them. Don't invite them into the house because they're there casing the joint. <coughs> Mentally, <coughs> review your daily activities. Identify areas and activities where you are most vulnerable. Start paying attention to your environment. What does the word criminal mean to you? Who's a criminal? It's not just a guy breaking the law. You have physical characteristics and strangers or persons known to you. You'd be surprised. You got a you got a son, and the son has got friends, and the son brings the friends into the home, and you happen to have a gun rack in the den. And the kid that the son brought in there to hang out at your home takes a look and he sees the guns hanging on the wall, and he tells his older brother, who has got some friends some of which may live in East Oakland. <laughs> and the next thing you know, the house is broken. Or Vallejo. Or Vallejo, yeah. Well, I didn't want to make it too close. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Common characteristics of criminals. So keep an eye out. You don't have to be an amateur shrink, but keep an eye out on the people that come into your neighborhood, that come into your house, that come into your sphere of influence. I'm on, I'm on that. Common yeah. characteristics of criminals. Low yeah, self-esteem. Very selfish. Okay? Lack of conscience and a sense of mercy. They're sociopaths. They don't care it's your stuff. They don't care where it came from or how you got it. 
They view niceness as weakness. Woo, sounds like Muslims, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, blend, they blend in well to appear non-threatening. They're just tripping along and they're constantly seeking criminal opportunity. From that perspective, they're a lot smarter than you are because they're looking to engage in a criminal activity and you're not. And you're not aware that somebody might be. So, there are different levels of mental preparedness. You don't have to sit there and 458 milligrams of, uh, of uh, five hour energy in your home. If you're in there, the door's locked, the windows are locked, okay? So you have a low level of mental preparedness if you're sitting in the comfort of your home. Now you leave your home. All of a sudden, your mental awareness ought to kick in a little bit higher. Where are you going? Well, I'm just walking down the street to 7-Eleven. That's okay. Of course, it's been robbed twice in the last month. And that might not be a good place for you to happen to be in when the guy walks in with a gun and, and, and holds a joint up. Okay? And your high level is in an unknown area that may be associated with crime. Where are you going? Who's going with you? How are you going to get there? Okay? Is your friend you're going with going to drop you off and leave? Safety in numbers. Safety in numbers. Old joke. With all deference to the pastor here, you know why nuns travel in pairs? So one nun watches the other nun, make sure that nun don't get none. <laughs> you know that joke. You can't tell me. I, I, spent, I spent five years playing golf twice a week with a priest. And this is where these things came from. Okay, mental condition. Develop a mental plan of action. Remember, we've got mindset. I'm going to protect myself. Mindset. Tactics. Okay, what are you going to do if you're confronted with an uncomfortable situation? The first thing you should do is retreat. Find a way to retreat. Always leave yourself an escape route. Okay, where am I going to go if, okay? There's two doors over here. It's a Monty Hall thing. If I go over here like this elevator, you've got two elevators, one opens up and there's a couple of weird looking characters in the elevator, don't get in the elevator. All of a sudden start fidgeting in your purse. Oh, I think I lost my whatever it is. That's okay, you guys go ahead, I'll take the next one. Tactics, think tactics, okay? Consequences of your reactions could result in a criminal prosecution or a civil lawsuit against you. Okay, especially in the case of using a firearm outside your home. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes and I'll tell you how to get away with it. Drag them in. No, you wait till they come in. We'll talk about that. Is your home a safe place? Okay, the majority of sexual assaults take place in the victim's homes. That's in your home, not in somebody else's home. According to the U.S. Department of Justice study, if you're home when a criminal gains entry, there is a one in three chance of becoming a victim of violence. There's a difference between a burglary of an unoccupied home and a burglary of an occupied home. Now, if you're asleep in your home and it's 3 a.m. in the morning and it's darker than three feet up a cow and all of a sudden you hear the window breaking out in the living room and you've got cars parked in the driveway and the bad guy trying to get in knows that that home is occupied, expect the worst. Think of the risk that they're taking. It's a much greater risk than casing a neighborhood and hitting an empty house while the people are on vacation. There is no threat of bodily harm. So your mental preparedness and your mindset's got to be a little different, okay? What am I going to do if I come home and find my house burglarized is a lot different than what am I going to do at 3 in the morning and I hear somebody kicking in the front door. Big difference. Speaking of doors, do you like that segue? That one's a good one. Okay, speaking of doors. I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> there's garage doors, there's front side rear entry doors, sliding glass doors, pet doors, door viewers, door frames, all kinds of things like this. What I teach people to do 
And there's, these are some of the things that I put into this program based on my experience. If you park, how many people here park your car in the garage? Carport. I will bet you garage. Oh, garage door. Open and closing garage door. I will bet you that every one of you that park in the garage, pull your car straight into the garage. You sit in the car. You wait. You raise up the door. I almost had FUD syndrome there. You raise up the door. Raise up the door. <laughs> you raise up the door, right? And, and you pull straight forward into the garage, and then you really don't get out of your car, do you? Except the ladies don't. I know that until you put the garage door down, right? Learn to back into your garage, especially at night. You can go get a couple of cinder blocks. Okay, back the car in carefully, put a couple of blocks behind the rear wheels so that you know not to back into your kitchen. <laughs> back into your garage. Learn to back into the garage, especially at night. Because you don't know when you open the garage door, and this happened to my neighbor across the street. And it was great because I heard her, and I was there at least ten minutes before the police showed up. You pull in the garage and you drop the garage door. Now you're trapped. And if there's somebody at night hiding on the side of your garage, they wait till the garage door goes up, you drive in, they slide into the garage, they're standing behind your car, you can't see them, the garage door goes down, now what? Now you're trapped in the cage with them. Now if you did see them, just back up. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, you have to replace your garage door, but okay, that, that could be the least of your problems. You probably got homeowners insurance. Learn to back into the garage. Now, when you're coming down the street and it's at night, you turn on your bright lights. Bad guys hate two things. They hate noise and they hate light. So you turn on your brights as you're coming down your street in your neighborhood and you light up the neighborhood and you leave the bright lights on as you are backing into the garage because now you have a complete field of vision in front of you on the street that's all lit up. Okay? I'm a proponent of Napoleon. I've got uh -huh. the second largest private collection of original Napoleon documents in the country <laughs> and I love some of the military maxim he said and he said a broader field of vision gives a broader field of fire. Don't have tunnel vision. Don't have tunnel vision. He also said, never interrupt your enemy when they're in the process of killing himself. So, <laughs> now you want to know why Romney, who is a brilliant, educated man, didn't go after Obama about yes. Benghazi. Yes. Because Obama was killing himself anyway. That's right. Okay, so learn to do that. Then we talk about locks, all right? A deadbolt is nice, but a deadbolt only keeps honest people honest. All right, if you take this door over here and you close that thing with a deadbolt, I guarantee you about three kicks from me and that door is going to open up. What you want is you want one of these little gizmos. They're $2 over at Home Depot. The flip lock. You put one on each one of your doors and you put one on your safe room, which is probably going to be your master bedroom. When you go to bed at night, you shut your bedroom door and you flip that lock. Okay? Again, you're buying time. That's going to be your safe room. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. You got all of these various door locks and stuff like that. That is the best lock that you can get. It's $2 at Home Depot. It's a flip lock. Go buy five or six of them. Put them on every outside entry door to your house. It buys time. Flip lock. Now, the screws inside these packages are worthless. They're an inch long. You want to at least screw them into the frame with two inch screws. Two inch screws, because otherwise somebody's going to kick the door and they're going to pull it out. And they'll take the frame with it. So you want two inch screws, minimum three inches or better. Okay, now, you have to designate a safe room in your house. How many people here essentially live alone as a couple or, or as a single person? Okay, so no small children in the house. You have small kids in the house. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. Okay? 
If you're by yourself, you designate a safe room. In the safe room, you've got to have a cell phone. Does everybody know that dead cell phones will always be able to call 911? Yes. Even if you don't have service. A cell phone is designed by law that if the battery is not dead, okay, and you have no service, you're not paying for service for it, it will still dial 911. So the next time you upgrade your cell phone, take the old cell phone and put it in your safe room. Put it in your master bedroom, okay? You don't want to trust the landline because if guys really want to get in badly enough, they're going to cut the wire. So you have a cell phone. Okay, most of your alarm systems now with ADP and, and Broadview and Bay Alarm stuff, they all now call them through the box using a cell phone. It's not hardwired to your landline. And that's very important because they can't disrupt that. So you have flashlights, extra batteries, you're not going to turn lights on in the case of a home invasion. The last thing you want to do is turn a light up. Home and automobile keys. Now this is something very interesting. Okay? You see these? I would bet you that probably 95% of everybody in this room has got one of these things on their keys. Right? You got a car that's less than 10 years old. The little red button. You know this red button? Okay, my car is parked right outside here. If I hit that red button, I'm going to set off my car alarm. I know because I tried it. Okay? These are good for up to about 50 feet. So what do you do? You take your car keys and the cell phone into your safe room if you don't have a regular home alarm system. Remember, the bad guys don't like noise. They don't like light. Home Depot, you can get some, some motion detector floodlights for like 20 bucks and just mount them in certain places around your home. But remember your little key fobs here and remember these panic buttons. Don't leave the keys sitting downstairs and you're upstairs when you would have to use that thing to set off the car alarm because that's going to scare people away. Types of windows, okay? There's double sash windows go up and down. The screw kind are actually the best kind that open up. There's a lot of ways that you can pin these things so that they can't be opened. That's all part of this, the whole four hour program. Lighting, okay, when you leave the house, get some $5 timers. Make lights go on and off at different times. Just set them, okay? Set one in the living room, goes off 11 o'clock, whatever it is. You can set one on a television. You can set one on a radio. Because guys who are casing the place, they're listening. And if they hear sounds coming from inside, they hear a TV going, they see lights going on and off. You remember the movie Home Alone? It's true. It's true. Outdoor lighting. Okay, if you don't have sufficient outdoor lighting, floods, then go get it, especially over your garage. Okay, you're going to back into the garage, you leave the brights on, but you'd like to have that whole area lit up, including the front porch. Shrubbery. Sounds like a Monty Python thing. Bring me a shrubbery. Okay? Shrubbery is a problem. How many places are there for somebody to hide here? Cut the shrubbery down. Cut the shrubbery down and light up the porch if that's your entry and exit area. Because you don't want to wind up with your back turned to your environment, going through the front door in the dark. There's no porch light. And bad guys, by the way, they like to unscrew the light. They unscrew the light. I mean, you know, they kill 3,000 people with box cutters. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Box cutters. Same thing over here. Nice manicured house. You've got this big tall hedge over here. Looks nice. You've got another hedge over here. Walk around your home. I do this, by the way. Uh, people hire me to come out to the house and set up their safe room, walk around the house, give them a complete report on certain uh, possible entry areas. You know, you got to figure if you if you figure you, you get your door, your exit doors properly protected. They might come through a window, 
But if they're going to walk out of your house with anything substantial, they're not going out the window with it. They're going to want to open the door and take it out that way. Then the alarm goes off. Speaking of alarms, there's different kinds of alarms. What's really good is if somebody's casing your house and you actually have an alarm system in there like I do, I have the keypad right by the front door and I don't make that silent. I want everybody in the neighborhood to know when I open my front door and it goes until I shut it off. And it's really cool when I come home, you know, like about 10 o'clock at night and the whole neighborhood knows my house is alarmed. Of course, I have a whole arsenal in the place, but that's beside me. Okay. Key fobs again. This is an alarm. Panic bus. You can use that as a cheap alarm. Dogs. Now, what's fun is you can go and buy off the internet a CD or a disc or a cassette. God, I hate even thinking about that. Not an 8-track. Of a barking German Shepherd. Okay? This is, okay, I'm just saying that you can get some audio of a barking dog. And you can hook that onto a timer. And so, you know, like every couple hours or something, all of a sudden there's a dog barking. Well, if there's some character sitting across the street and he's casing the neighborhood and he's listening and you got lights going on and off, there's a barking dog, he's not going to hit your house. Nope. He's not going to take that chance because there's too many morons out there who left the keys in the car, left the front door open, and there's 15 newspapers on the porch. Well, this has always been a safe neighborhood. Hello? What about my seven cats? I what are they going to do when cat. that dog starts barking? I have, well, I have. Okay. Did you lose one? No. <laughs> Separate your keys. Don't ever carry a key to your house on, on your, your car key. Car key. Because all they got to do is trace the license number, right? They know where you live and they got a key to your house. They steal your car. Gone. So when you take your car in for service, and a dealer would never do something like that, <laughs> you know, you see the commercials on TV and the girl with uh, the identity theft. Mm -hmm. and how about somebody stealing your house key? James Bond. Happens all the time. When I was a sheriff's deputy, I used to carry around a little key back. You know the little key back thing with the magnet on it? But it had clay in it. Shame on you. Oh, and I had a lot of shame. Bless you. Okay? Got a Slim Jim, too. And a lock that set. Hey, I got stories, okay? Sometimes, you know, you get shot fired inside the house, you gotta get into the house without getting hurt. Okay, so people do this, all right? It's very simple to take the key back, put some clay in the key back, and you take your car in for service or something, and you left your house key on there. When you fill out the service order required by the Bureau of Automotive Repair, all right, what do you do? You put your name and address and everything on there? They got your registration in the car. Okay? Don't leave your house keys on your car ring. Security. Visitors that come to your house. People who are trying to get you to vote for Obama. Get off my property. I've got a Where'd guard you dog. Where did you keep that gun? <laughs> we'll get to that. Hang on. One minute, Peter. One minute? One minute. Seriously. Okay. Just for this oh, yeah. portion. For our, inter our potty break. Okay. Know who is at your door. Okay? Hi. We're selling Gazunde. We want to give you a copy of the Watchtower. Saturday morning. Jehovah's Witnesses. Anybody in here a Jehovah's Witness? Anybody oh, good. I can me? tell that joke. I know one, and the guy never even saw the accident. Anyway. <laughs> These are the jokes. Oh, boy. Okay. Know who's standing on your porch. They have to be licensed. They can't come on your property and start selling you something. Don't just open the door. Okay? Halloween the other night. All right? My fiance is out there at the front door, and she's doling out all of the sugar stuff to the kids and everything and I'm sitting over there on the couch with a bead on the front door and my SIG 9mm sitting under the 
my leg on the couch. Just in case. Two strange characters came to the door. Okay, They sort of looked like they were in uh, costume, but I think they went to Salvation Army or something. You know, and they were kind of pushing at her. Okay, and then I said, Oh, Rose, you got a problem? Oh, boy. It's gone. Mm-hmm. They do that kind of stuff. Hi, we're soliciting here for whoever it happens to be. Can we talk to you? Uh, Astound uh, comes out there now in our neighborhood because now they've gotten permission to hook up cable and stuff like that. Come on. I, you see a TV repair truck in your neighbor's driveway and you know they're in Hawaii. Okay? Gee, and you see him coming out of her house with a television set. Hmm, looks normal. It's a TV repair place. You know, when you go over and you say something to him. Oh, well, you know, so-and-so left me the key to go in there. She wanted her TV fixed. Well, she's gone. Nah. So be a little bit suspicious. Or be a lot suspicious. If you go to the door, you look through the peephole. If you don't have one of those peepholes, go get one. And you look through the door, and it's not somebody that you know or somebody that looks like they ought to be there. Make sure that your cell phone is there, or at least it's somewhere close by. Remember that cell phone that you upgraded? And okay, mailbox services. All right, when you leave town for two weeks, shut the mail off. You don't want that stuff building up. We have mail delivery people today who they're going to put your mail wherever it's handy form to do it. Okay, remember they lost, what, four billion dollars in the last quarter, I yes. think? Something like that. Uh, the best thing to do would be get a post office box while you're away. It's that simple. Turn off the newspapers. Okay, just little things like this that you got to think of. It's on that checklist that uh, you handed out, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact. It's an excellent checklist. Are we almost there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we? take a break. Okay, I need to... Uh, I need Refuse to be a victim. <laughs> okay, physical security, aim, awareness. You've got to be aware if you're stumbling along and you're not paying attention, you're going to get victimized because that's the wolf looking for the lamb who's tail end Charlie. Intuition. Use your intuition. Now you guys, the ladies, you're incredible with your intuition. You can sense danger. Okay? We're big and ugly and macho and whatever it is, and we go pounding into stuff, and then we got to fight our way out of it. You guys know who you shouldn't date. Okay? You learned that early on. I know. I trained my daughter. Mindset again. The mindset. You've absolutely got to develop this mindset of self-protection. Okay? It's like the old line about whistling past the graveyard. You may be worried about it, but if you whistle and it exudes confidence, all right, and you're not slumping around when you're going around about your daily business, people are going to look at you and they're going to go, uh, that person's not defenseless. I'm going to find the other guy. That's what happens. Okay, I've been dealing with the FAA, for God's sake, for 40 years, and I can tell you right now, they always pick on the defenseless. That's why I teach the FARs to aircraft inspectors. Not a single one I have ever trained in 22 years ever got violated by the feds because they have the right answer. The same thing happens with a highway patrolman. You know why I stopped you? Uh, I don't know. You know what I always do? I got a little box with a couple of dead donuts in it on the front seat. The guy stops me and he says, you know why I stopped you? Yeah, you can smell the donuts. <laughs> You'll get out of the ticket. If you can get the cop laughing, I know, I've been there. You can get him laughing. He's going to go, I haven't heard that one before. If they're dead, don't give them one. Okay? Boundaries. You have to create personal boundaries for yourself. People who come into your space. Okay, do you remember when Al Gore and, and George Bush back in Oakland, oh, they were yeah. having the debate? And George is standing over here and Gore comes walking over to him and he stands right here like that. And Bush looked at him and he went Nodded. and kept on going. <laughs> that cost Gore the election. That cost Al Gore that election because he violated that space, that's personal space. You don't let anybody you don't want get within six feet of you. 
set boundaries. Automated teller machines. How many of you have gone to an ATM machine, other people are waiting, and you turn your back? Yeah. Don't turn your back, okay? Stand to the side, except when you're putting your PIN number in. And just cover it with your PIN number and stand there and keep an eyeball on everything going on around you. If you're uncomfortable, like getting into an elevator with people that you're uncomfortable with who are already in the elevator, go to another ATM machine. Go to a better lighted one. Go to one inside of the mall. Go to the one inside of a gas station. Don't go to an outdoor one by the bank out in the middle of nowhere, Sun Valley Mall, Bank of America. I can't tell you how many people have been robbed using the ATM machine at the Sun Valley Mall at night. It's just, it's amazing. Okay? When you're walking, don't walk with traffic. Walk against traffic. Walk against traffic. You want to see cars coming at you. You want to see people riding bicycles coming towards you so that if necessary, you can step aside. Okay, there are people who are out there on a dark street and you're walking home at night and you're walking with the traffic and they're either on a bicycle and they bump you off into the bushes or they come behind you with a car. Half the time you can't hear them. You don't see them. All they got to do is, is come up behind you with the lights off. You don't even know they're there unless they need a tune-up. Friends, somebody drops you off at your house late at night. Just ask them, hey, wait till I get inside the house. Right? Especially if the porch light is off or it's burned out, you didn't turn it on, something like that. 25 bucks, you can put a motion detector flood lamp right there. Whole place lights up as you walk up there. It's worth the $25. Elevators. When you get into an elevator, don't just push the floor that you're on if you're the only person in the elevator. If you're the first person in the elevator, press two or three floors, press the ones that are above you because that gives the impression to anybody else who gets in the elevator till you get your floor that there are people who are above who have pressed the button to come back down. Okay? So, just a little gizmo here. Waiting for elevators, enter or don't enter. Don't get in the elevator if you're not comfortable. You're in an enclosed box, okay? Don't get in there if you're not comfortable getting in there. Lights don't function. One of the main things that bad guys do is they unscrew the light bulb. Put the bulb up high enough to where they can't unscrew it without a ladder. You're not going to carry around one of those poles with that spring clip on there, you know, to undo the thing. So if you're going to put some motion sensor floods on the garage, put them up under the eave of the garage. That way nobody can get up there and unscrew the bulbs. When you're carrying your purse, God almighty, last night it was over at Knob Hill Foods. And if there's anybody in here who's union, I'm sorry, I hate unions. They went on picket last night, and I drove from Pleasant Hill to Knob Hill Foods just so I could cross the picket line. <laughs> <laughs> then I got into an argument with a couple of these yahoos outside. Oh, the meat cutters are on strike. It's a 10-year-old kid walking around with a sign. And I'm going, really? You're awful young to be a meat cutter. <laughs> And the guy says, why are you crossing our picket line? I said, because I think you've got a lot of chutzpah in this environment getting paid what you get paid an hour to go on strike when there are people who are starving who have been out of work for two years. Right. And they'll take your job in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's what they should do to drive the union south. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> your purse. Last night, I'm up there at Knob Hill Foods. There's a nice lady up there, she's got her shopping cart, she's walking down the aisle, and she's got her purse there where you stick the little kid, right? And the purse is just sitting there, and she's over here taking stuff off the shelf. So I walked... Like it's a baby. Pardon? You strap it in like it's a baby. Thank you very much. So I walked over to this lady, and I said, excuse me, ma'am, I said, is that your purse? Uh, yeah, why? I said, do you realize that I could have been in my car and hitting the freeway with your purse by the time you turned around to put that stuff in the shopping cart? Oh my God, you see the strap 
There's a strap to strap the kid in there. Run the strap around the purse. So somebody can't just walk by, pick up the purse, and keep on walking. Yeah, I do that. What, you grab the purse and keep on no. walking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I strap it into the kid thing. Yeah. You have to. My kid gets upset, but I don't know. <laughs> no, you, well, you're strapping the purse to the kid. Okay. Yeah. Mugger money. Mugger money is really good. You got a lot of cash you're carrying around? Don't carry it in your main pocket. Stick it in your back pocket, put it in your sock, put it somewhere else. What you do is you take a $20 bill or a $10 bill, you wrap it around a bunch of ones. All right? You're buying time now. So some guy stands over here, he's, give me your dough. Okay, you take the mugger money roll out and you throw it at him. You don't hand it to him. You throw it at him and you turn around and you run like hell. What's he going to be doing while you're turning around retreating? He's going to be kneeling down picking up the money. Mugger money. Just a little thing. Anybody here ever gone to Paris? Anybody here gone to Paris? Go to the Louvre, you know where the glass pyramid is? And they have all the little Romanian gypsies walking around there and the kid comes up and he takes a newspaper and he goes like this and the other kid comes up behind you and... I have an umbrella. Distract and rob. I don't have one of these, yeah. I don't have one of these little fold up... I, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, you can stick it in your purse or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Man, I got an umbrella like this, okay, with a steel shaft on it, and I ground the point. I ground the end of that sucker to a point. <laughs> that kid comes anywhere near me, I'm going to turn him into a popsicle. <laughs> decoy wallet. A you Romanian can have a decoy popsicle. wallet. Just take an old wallet. Doesn't have to have anything in it, okay? Put your real wallet somewhere else, take your decoy wallet, decoy wallet out, and say, okay, fine, here. And he's gone. And here's the schnook, he's down here on his hands and knees. Of course, if you're one of us, well, he goes down for the wallet. That's a whole different issue. Okay? What? I mean, your life's not worth that. You know, just to get into that. Your car, keep one arm free, well-lit areas, panic buttons, Etc. 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 Approaching and entering, exiting your car. You can take your keys when you're approaching your car, and you can take your keys and you did, do this with your keys. Brass knuckles. Brass knuckles. Some guy grabs you. You tear their face right open. It works. Unless he's cute. Well, that's a whole different issue. Then you take them home, right? Okay. Um, look inside the car. For God's sake, lock your car. Lock your car. You get in the car, you look inside to make sure that there isn't some drunk laying on the floor in the back seat, which happens, especially at the mall, happens all the time, especially over Christmas. Look in the car. Okay? Get into the car. Close the car door. Lock the car. Oh, no. Well, once I start it up and I start to drive, you know, it's a Toyota. It automatically locks the car. Too late. The car's not moving. The door's not locked. And you just hit your little button here that opened the doors. Get in the car. Lock the doors. God gave you air conditioning. Okay? The car God gave you air conditioning. It's hot in the car. Turn on the air. Lock the car. Leave your windows up. Okay? Somebody comes up behind you to stop you. It looks like a police officer. That's fine. Pull into a nice lighted area. Don't open the window all the way. Open the window down about that much. Let him come to you. Keep your hands right there on the steering wheel. I want to see your hands at all times. Guy comes up. What's the problem, officer? Is he really a police officer? It's okay not to lower the window. It's okay to say, would you mind calling your backup? Okay? He'll respect that. I would respect that. Passenger side windows. Don't roll the windows down. Leave the windows up. If you want to talk to somebody, they're standing right there at the window. You could hear them. Okay. Also, if you think somebody's following you, okay, so make a series of turns. If you really think they're following you, don't lead them back to your house. 
oh, I want to get back to my house where I can be safe. No, 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 no. Go to the police station. Okay? So make a series of turns to find out if they're following you, and then take them to the local PD. <laughs> gas tanks. Gas tanks. I know gas is over four bucks a gallon. Gee whiz, it was only less than half of that four years ago. Abortion clinic. Keep your car gas tank half full. If it gets down to half, fill it. There's nothing like running out of gas on a dark night just because you didn't really want to take the 10 minutes or whatever it is to go put gas in the car. Gets down to half a tank, go put gas in the car. Make sure that you have a cell phone with you in the car. Okay? You don't want to get out of the car if you have a problem. You stay in the car and you call 911 from the cell phone. That's one thing about the cell phone. Uh, one time, uh, I was told that if you do 911, it, it's not the 911 call. Well, you got to hit enter. Yes, I know. It or, the local yeah, it's going to go to the local highway patrol. Yeah, it'll go to the highway patrol. It won't go to the police station. Unless you get put on hold and you wait well, and you wait and you wait and, then, and you and wait. Then it's okay. Yeah, huh? Uh, yeah. Just don't get out of the car. Uh, Stay in a light, lit area. Don't Nobody get out of the car. Nobody's starting on 911. If you're walking around going to the highway patrol, you dial 411 and then dial 911. Don't, hey. don't confuse the issue. Well, 411? Yeah, no, I know. But, you know, you got to understand, people at that point are panicked. And we'll talk about a home invasion at 3 in the morning in a minute, speaking of adrenaline. <laughs> Okay, accident, police car, stay in the car, partially lower your window, and request another officer to show up, okay? Because he's going to show up and he's going to go, who are you? Right? They know each other. Hitchhikers, do I have to tell you? Never pick up hitchhikers. Never stop for an accident. Never stop for an accident. If you're going to stop and you want to get involved, then pass the accident up. Go 100 yards down the street, take your cell phone, call it in. Don't get out of your car and try and help because most of the times it's a scam. You get out, you come over, they grab you, now they got your car, you just got carjacked, and whatever else is involved. Road rage. <coughs> Guy cuts you off, please don't give him the finger. Just, Not he's a schmuck. The guy's a Democrat probably. Just let him go. Let him go. His life is far more miserable than yours is. And the problem we have in our environment today in this country with this economy is that the only control that people have in their lives today is when they get into their car. And if you screw with somebody who is in that frame of mind with that mindset in their car, it's not going to turn out well for you. So just look at them and smile and go, yeah, you're going to get yours. Be careful with self-service gas stations. Well, they're all self-service. Okay? Try not to get gas at night, depending upon where you've eaten. But anyway, don't keep your car half full. Get gas, okay, when it gets to half full. Uh, staged accidents, we just talked about that. Now, here's something interesting that we do in law enforcement. The rule of thumb is when you come to a stop behind another car, stay at least one car length back from that car. That gives you an escape route. If you can't see the tires on the rear of the car in front of you, you're too close. You can't pull left or right. So think about that when you're driving down the street. Well, what about if you're in a stop sign? Because that's aggravating if everybody leaves a car length between them. So Do you care? <laughs> She's paused long enough to say, yes, I do care. <laughs> okay, we're talking about you. All right? I want you to be safe. So if somebody comes up to the car and you've got to get out of there in a hurry, now you've left yourself an escape route and you can pull right, you can pull left. See this distance right here? Yeah. That's barely enough, but here you see plenty of distance. Better to have somebody honking behind you and have somewhere to go, then pull right up on the other guy's bumper. What happens if this guy is driving a stick shift car, misses his shift, puts it in reverse and creams your radiator? Leave a car length between the two of you. 
<coughs> identity theft. Okay, you were talking about no, who was it? Um, gentleman back there from the NRA was talking about how he gets all these emails like I do from Nigeria. Oh, you got an uncle that died and he left you fifty million dollars, but you got to send us a thousand bucks to handle the transfer. Yeah, okay. Don't, don't, don't. I can't tell you how many of those I delete off of my email every single day. Okay? I don't have an uncle. I don't have one. Check identifications, debit check cards. Okay? When you hand somebody your debit card and you're buying something, better to use a credit card, not the debit card. The debit card is like cash. And people know that because it says debit on it. Okay? And what happens is, just like the commercial for uh, LifeLock, which I've been a charter member of as, since they started, and all you got to do is take a pencil and a piece of paper and go like this, and all your information is right there in that piece of paper. Use a credit card. Don't use a debit card. Always use the Cabela's card because you get points back on it. Use the what? Always use your Cabela's credit card. Oh, okay. Come back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Cabela. Yeah. All right. Um, obviously, you never give out your passwords or your PIN numbers. You ought to change your password or PIN number once a month, maybe. You know, LifeLock, by the way, is excellent and it works. Yes. It works. Okay. Uh, a shredder. Yeah. You see people going through somebody's garbage across the street from your house. Guess what they're looking for? Bank statements, credit card bills, just little things like that. Personal protection devices, personal alarms, tear gas. The, the tear gas doesn't work. You've got to get too close to somebody to use tear gas. If you want gas, use wasp spray. Mace, you're going to use it on you. A whistle. A whistle's good. You know, you can go to the nearest Boy Scout council or pharmacy or something, buy a whistle. Keep it on your purse. Start blowing the whistle. They do that in England. Firearms. Okay, now what's interesting is in the actual program there is a firearm supplement. Mainly because once you get through the refuse to be a victim program, we would like to have you move on and maybe take some responsible firearm training. Toward that end. Toward that end. Anybody here former law enforcement, current law enforcement? Okay. Oh, good. I can lie. All right. If you ever have to use a firearm to protect yourself, do not fire a warning shot and do not shoot to wound. Now, a very good classic case is the Trayvon Martin thing in George Zimmerman in Florida. Dead men don't tell tales. Dead men cannot testify against you. Okay? Now, I can tell you for a fact, being, having been in law enforcement and having been involved in a number of firearm events, that if somebody's wounded, they get very angry. And at some point, they're going to come back after you. So it's much easier to avoid the problem. Now we get into the mindset again. To protect yourself, your family, or a neighbor, do you have the mindset to blow somebody away? Now in California, the self-defense law says that you have to use, or you are allowed to use, deadly force to neutralize the threat. That's it. And then you have to retreat. Okay? Because self-defense is only applicable to neutralize the threat that you perceive. Now, my perception of a threat is going to be different than yours. Okay? Somebody comes into your house at 3 o'clock in the morning and you hear glass breaking or somebody's breaking through the front door and it's 3 a.m., your perception of what may happen is a whole lot different than mine. Okay? Because you are thinking, he's going to hurt me, and I'm going to wake up thinking, oh, am I going to hurt him? <laughs> okay? It's like the guy who knows karate. All right? So if you know karate, and you get into a fight with somebody, 
and you do great bodily harm to them, it's a whole lot different than if you swung a baseball bat at the bad guy and cold cocked him. Okay? So again, here's mindset and tactics. God forbid anybody ever gets into a shooting event, you neutralize the threat. Wait a minute, you mean the bat? You could get in trouble for using the bat? As I can, you can't. Classic story, okay? Down in San Bernardino, we get a, a call from dispatch, shots fired. Okay? In a home, residential home. So we roll over there, right? Front door is knocked in. So my partner and I come up on the porch, we look inside to see what's going on. It's a guy laying on his face on the floor in the living room. There's a nice lady who's sitting in a lazy boy with her husband, who, who used to be a police officer, all right, long gone. She's about 80 years old, and she's sitting there with an old cult police positive, 38 special. And she's got it sitting there in her lap. And she's sitting there with this pistol like this, and she's looking at the guy on the floor. So I'm looking at her, and obviously this woman is in shock. She is catatonic. Okay? So I talked to her from across the room and explained to her that the police are here. She's safe now. Right? There's no further danger to her. And I talked to her all the way across the living room the carpet, and I got right up next to her, not in front of her, but right next to her, <coughs> and, I, and I asked if I could take the gun. And she sat there looking at me, and I'm watching the gun, and the hand's not moving. And so I explained to her, okay, I'm going to take the gun from you. You're safe. You're safe. We're here, and you did a good job. Okay? You protected yourself. You protected your home. And she released her grip on the gun. And I took the gun, and I put it in the back of my pants, and I stood there and talked to her for about five minutes. She never said a word. She was still in shock, so I took out the clipboard and I started to write. I said, ma'am, let me see if I can figure out what happened here tonight. I said, you were sound asleep, and I said, you heard somebody trying to bust through your front door, and you got the, the pistol out of the nightstand drawer, and you came to the bedroom door where it enters the living room, and you saw this man, he saw you with the gun, and instead of turning and leaving, he came towards you, and you protected yourself, and you shot him three times. I said, that's what happened, isn't it? And she kind of looked at me, and you could see this, the corner of her mouth go up, just, just a little bit, so you, you knew that this registered, and she went, I said, that's good, because this is what I'm putting in my report. Okay? <laughs> and we thank you very much. <laughs> okay? So you need to have a mindset as to what you're going to do. Now here's what you're going to do. First of all, you've got to designate a safe room in your house. Okay? And we'll talk about what do you do with kids. But you designate a safe room, you get a flip lock, you put it on the bedroom door. When you go to sleep at night, lock the bedroom door. That's half the battle right there. So now you've got your key alarm in there, you've got your cell phone in there, and you've got that firearm sitting in there somewhere, loaded. An unloaded firearm at home is worthless. State of California is going to tell you, oh, put it unloaded in a locked container and store the ammunition somewhere else. Yeah. Thank you, Kamala Harris. No. In your home. Where did I put the key? No. In your home. You can buy a three combination digit gun vault, it's a little metal box, it's got a three little, little three digit lock on this thing. You can get all kinds of containers. You can get fancy $300 biometric containers. You don't need to. Okay, so what happens now? You're in your room, you installed the flip lock, three o'clock in the morning, you hear glass breaking. Somebody's trying to come through the living room window. What do you do? First thing you do is you get the gun. Number one, get the gun. Now you have the gun, okay? Now you can protect yourself. Number two, you go for cover. Now cover is on the floor behind the bed, between the bed and the wall, okay? Get behind the dresser, get down low. And the reason you want to be down low is because in the dark people 
automatically shoot high. They automatically shoot high, it's human nature. You're down low. You're going to shoot high in the dark. Guess who you're going to hit? If they come through the bedroom door firing, they're not going to hit you because they don't expect you to be down low hiding behind something. So now you've got your keys, hopefully, you've got your cell phone, you got the gun, and you're down behind cover. Door's locked. Okay? You're in good shape. Now, what do you do? You dial 911. The dispatcher comes on, she says, this is 911, what's your emergency? You're cool, calm, and collected. Hi, my name is Jane Doe. I live at 123 Front Street. I have a break-in in progress. I am locked in my master bedroom and I'm armed. I want to know that. If I'm the responding officer, I want to know where you are. I want to know who's with you or other people in the house. And I really want to know if you're armed. Okay? And the dispatcher will probably say, are you alone? Okay? No, I'm in here with my husband or I'm in here with my wife or I'm in here with my two kids or whatever it happens to be. And I'll get to your point in a minute. Okay? Now you're on the phone with the dispatcher. She's got your name. She's got your address. She knows you're armed and she knows your location inside the home. That's very important to the responding officers. We want to know that. Okay? Now, this is all on tape because every time you call 911, it's tape. And that's good for you because you don't know what kind of legal problems you're going to have later on if there's actually a shooting event. So you want all of this on tape. So now they say we're sending officers. Okay? That's terrific. Now what you do is you yell out, you're on tape, you yell out to the intruder. Okay? I don't know who you are in my house, but you better get the hell out of my house because I'm on a phone with 911, the cops are on their way, and if you come into my bedroom, I'm armed. Now you have given warning. Okay? It's on tape. Now, what's going to happen? Either whoever it is that broke into your house is going to take off, or they're not going to retreat. And if they don't retreat, you're still on 911, you're still being taped, and now somebody's pushing on the bedroom door to come in, and now you're going to warn them a second time. I don't know who you are, but you're trying to break into my bedroom. This bachelor's here in the whole thing being taped. If you come any further, you're dead. Okay? Now, if they do something really stupid and they try to break through the bedroom door, you're going to take them out. It's all on tape. Oh, I warned you. Okay? Cool, calm, collected, mindset, tactics. You know exactly what to do. And at that point, the average home invasion firearm event takes place at seven feet or less. So, take a look. I'm seven feet away from that screen right now seven feet or less. The average police shooting takes place at three feet. That's kind of hard to believe. You go up to the range and the, you know, you're at 25 yards or 15 yards and if you can hit the paper at 20 yards or 25 yards, imagine what you can do in your home at three o'clock in the morning at five feet. Ten feet. What's the longest room in your house? Now you're not going to go outside. Okay, so now what happens is you scare this person off, the person leaves, and the cops show up, right? And now here comes the, the police officer, and the police officer is inside going, uh, Mrs. Doe, uh, this is officer so-and-so, I'm inside your house, I'm in the hallway, uh, can you at least knock on the master bedroom door so I know where it is? Now how do you know he's the police? Yeah, how do you know he's the police? Okay? Safe to open the door. No. Remember, you're on the phone with 911. So you tell the dispatcher, okay, look, I have a guy standing outside my bedroom door. He is identifying himself as Officer Johnson. Will you please verify with the police office, okay, that they actually have dispatched Officer Johnson? Okay? Now, don't walk out of the room when you finally verify the police officer with a gun in your hand. Okay? Now, as the police, the responding officer, I'm going to say, ma'am, I understand you're armed. Yeah, I'm armed. I got a 357 here. I got a Smith Model 686. 
Nice, very nice. Yeah, I've got one of those too. Would you mind putting it down on the bed, please? Okay, and then come out of the bedroom, all right, with, where I can see your hands. Okay, that's what you need to do. And I'm up against flush up against the hallway. Tell you a funny story. We were in East LA one time in '67 when I was with LA County. We got a domestic call. I got to put some humor into this. We get a domestic call, and I was doing a ride along, fresh out of the academy. I had two regular LA County deputies in the front of the patrol car, and I'm sitting in the back. We get this domestic abuse call. We roll up here in, in East LA in Eagle Rock, if anybody knows Southern California. Old Spanish house, um, steps going up to the porch, stone steps, rose bushes on both sides of the thing here columns up here on the porch, you know, with a little canopy over this thing. And these two yahoos that I'm riding with, they're sitting down here on either side of the porch. Go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. Go up there. Handle it. So I walk up to the porch, got the whole football outfit on, knock on the door, and the door swings open. Now, standing over there, kind of like where that window is, is this 300-pound gorilla with a 12-gauge. Okay, and a guy standing there like this, and I'm standing there like my pants are down, going, um, I'm in the doorway. Only took that one time. I'm in the doorway, and the guy says, and I'll clean it up. What do you want? I said, Well, sir, um, I'm Deputy Friedman, and uh, I'm here to try and sell you some tickets to the sheriff's ball. The guy says, The sheriff doesn't have balls. I said, you're right, not this one. <laughs> and I threw myself off the porch into the rose bushes, screaming gun to the other two idiots. And they're up there telling the guy, put their shotgun down, you know. They, and I'm inside the rose bushes. It took them an hour to get me out of the rose bushes and destroyed about a $150 worth of uniform pants and shirt, trying to extricate me out of there. So sometimes a little humor can go a long way. You know, what do you want? Well, I'm here to sell you some tickets to the sheriff's ball. Maybe? Okay. <laughs> Mindset. Think about what you're doing. Think about your environment. Think about what's going on around you. Be cognizant of everything that's going around on around you. Okay, then, and I'll be done here in a minute. As part of the actual three to four hour seminar, there are additional modules depending upon the group that's involved. So one of them, you can add on this workplace module, what do you do to protect yourself in a workplace? Parents and kids. I'm gonna tell you about that right now, okay? My son, who happens to be a deputy for Cocoa County, uh, is married, he also flies the Cliff Bar corporate jet uh, so if anybody knows what cliff bars are, please buy cliff bars. They're good for you and helps, you know, so child support never ends. And they have three little kids, okay? Mikey's eight, Jonathan is four, and Caitlin is three. And I finally had to explain to him how that happened. Okay. So I sat down with them and we developed a code word because David is gone for sometimes three, four days a week. And we developed a code word that the kids liked, and I let them choose the code word. And Mikey said, okay, our code word is going to be eagle. And I said, okay. So I said, here's the deal. I said, at 3 o'clock in the morning, if you hear your mother scream eagle, then you come out of your bedroom, you go into your brother's bedroom, and you lock the door and flip the lock. Now, the two boys are at the other end of the hallway upstairs, and the master bedroom and the baby's room are right next to each other. So essentially, Jennifer is going to come out of her room, she's going to go into the baby's room, that's her safe room. Okay? Not the master bedroom at that point. So now, she's got the keys, she's got a key fob now, the, the SUV is parked downstairs in the driveway, She's got the cell phone sitting in there. She runs in there, locks the door. She's got a firearm stuck up in the closet in a biometric safe, and that's their safe room. Now she's gonna call 911. 
So the kids know that they have this code word, you can make a game at it, you run a couple of drills. So if you ever have uh, grandkids that come over or something like that, come up with a code word. It's an emergency code word, and they don't tell anybody what it is. But if they hear an adult yell at in the middle of the night, they know exactly what to do. Okay? They also have the fire ladder in the other bedroom. And Mikey, we, we trained him how to undo the rope ladder, hook it on the windowsill, and drop the ladder down. So parents and kids, senior citizens, persons with physical disabilities, people in wheelchairs, people walking with canes, okay? You're giving a physical appearance of being vulnerable, okay? Take that cane and put a nice little nail in the bottom of the thing or something. Anyway, um, questions. Imagine this going on for four hours. Mm. But we have a whole work work did, up here. It? <laughs> <laughs> Felt like it. Children? No, intruders. outside the house. Outside the house. Should you go after them? No, you don't leave your house. It's like your car. Okay? You're secure in your car. You don't shoot them either. No, you don't shoot them either. Okay? They got to be in your house. You can invite them in as long as you don't have a witness. <laughs> Come on in! Bam! Yeah, I, I just... Okay? But at least develop the mindset, the tactics, figure out what you're going to do. Okay? Just go through some scenarios. What are we going to do? You want to, you want to make sure whoever else is in the house is safe. you got to have a plan. And the very last thing that's involved involves marksmanship. Now, if you really want to take over, get a 12-gauge shotgun. Get a Mossberg Persuader, 12-gauge, 18-and-a-half-inch barrel. Put number four heavy game loads in it because there is no sound in the world in the dark like a pump shotgun cycling. You cannot mistake that sound for any other sound anywhere. Sir? In addition, uh, I use sixes, but I've never met a surgeon yet that can sew a hand or they're not getting a mistake even. Mm -hmm. Don't use double lot buck. Double lot buck that we use in law enforcement is nine thirty-two caliber balls. Okay, it'll take a door off of a car. You fire double lot buck off in a house. It's going to go through the perp. It's going to go through this wall into the next room, into that wall, through that wall, and into your neighbor's house. It's like three fifty-seven magnums. You don't shoot 357 Magnums. You shoot 38 special wad cutters or semi wad cutters, low velocity, flat nose, because you want them to stick in whatever you hit with them. Okay? That's the kind of stuff that the air marshals use. How about black talon? No, that stuff's. No. No, lasers, hydroshocks, all the rest of that stuff. That it's ridiculous. Look, your mm. shooting is going to take place. Your home invasion, invasion, firearm event is going to take place at under ten feet. Well, it's my understanding that the black talon is frangible. It'll get a frangible and won't go in the next room. Ah, shot placement. Shot placement. Okay, that's what's more important than trying to rely on a pistol round becoming frangible because if you don't hit somebody if you're going to do that get a shotgun you cannot miss with the shotgun and you may you may scare them off just by pumping the thing all the rest of this stuff you're paying double three times the price and it's called home defense ammo okay it's a scam you don't need it shot placement learn gun control. Well, you should call those guys at NRA because I just read the article about which rounds are the best. I know. I did, what, Whatever. Okay, which rounds are the best to do what? Kill somebody. Where? In your home? It's two months ago, about 45 ACP, which, you know, which has the best... 230 go. grain, okay? You fire a 230 anyway. grain silver tip, Okay? <laughs> Law enforcement, we use 40 cal. 
That's it. 40 cal, not frangible, not nothing special, straight jacketed hollow point 40 cal. Oh. And Homeland Security just bought 450 million rounds of that. I'm, buying, they expect yeah, I'm buying grenades. I don't care what I'm doing. Not if they're inside your house. You don't know. It's dark. If they're in your house and they are coming towards you, that's their choice. That's their choice. Okay? I didn't hear that. Is there any more questions? Any more questions? What's back here? Somebody with a knife ready to stick a smaller. Rip up. I don't want. This is the NRA. They don't. Do uh, yeah, I don't want to get close enough again to anybody with. That's a whole other story. Some. What is frangible? Who said what's frangible? Oh, frangible means that it, it powders out. It's not a single.